Good morning, everybody. I'm Dennis Martino. I know that all of you have been uh, waiting uh, to see Dan Bromberg, who typically is the facilitator for Coffee and Conversation. And uh, he is uh, has been waylaid with a number of items uh, going on uh, with the university and uh, asked me if I could facilitate this. So I have to be, I have to disclose a couple of facts. One is I'm part of this group. <laughs> and uh, I uh, I pitched the idea of having people uh, who are part of the National Organization for Human Services to talk about a couple of things like what's, what are, how are we filling jobs? What What does it look like? What does the labor market look like for people with human with uh, who work in the human services how did covid uh, uh impact uh the way we do business the people that are on the panel i'm going to ask them to introduce themselves they are all faculty members at different schools uh i am uh, personally uh an adjunct faculty member at granite state college and an adjunct faculty member at uh, springfield college uh, both of which I've been doing for over 20 years now. And uh, I know I don't look that old, but I dyed my hair white to look like Richard Gere and it didn't work out. So, Nicole, could you tell us uh, uh, where you work and a little bit about how you got involved in uh, the National Organization for Human Services? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. So, um, Nicole Kras, I am Associate Professor and Program Coordinator um, at Gutman Community College, which is one of the city universities of New York uh, located in Manhattan. Um, I'm former president of the New England Organization for Human Services, um, and then I serve on the board for the um, Council for Standards in Human Service Education, the Accreditation Board, and um, as a peer reviewer for the Journal of Human Services. Um, so I got involved with the New England organization um, when I was at Lincoln College of New England, and we were working on developing a human service program. And then the then president, Charles Kelly, um, kind of worked with us and mentored us and then got me involved in the uh, organization and then kind of moved up from there. It's a great, great organization um, and great people. So kind of helping to promote, you know, human service education, especially in our region. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, how about if I switch over to you, uh, Janine? Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Janine Spinola-Taylor. I'm assistant professor at Springfield College. I'm its former OL program coordinator. I designed its present graduation, uh, graduate program organizational leadership. I got involved with, NEO, uh, with NOSH uh, as a student. I thought it was important as a human service student to be aligned with a professional organization. And it is one that I tell my students to, uh, to also. I'm its former 2021 conference chair uh, for its virtual annual conference. And presently I am the secretary of NEOS and was also a presenter at one of their annual conferences. So welcome. Thank you very, very much. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask um, uh, Bill Morgan uh, who's, also notorious because of his degree. He's a JD, so we all we all love lawyers. Bill, could you uh, fill us in on your background and what you're doing right now and et cetera? Okay, good morning. Um, well, I, I started in teaching in 2007. Uh, I consider myself a mercenary adjunct. I, I <laughs> teach at many schools at different locations. Currently, I'm at Dean College. And Franklin Mass. I teach online for was Cal U. Now it's Penn West, California University of Pennsylvania, in their graduate program. I teach uh, for Wilmington University in Newcastle, Delaware, online in their undergraduate um, program for criminal justice. And I've designed courses online for all those schools and more. I got involved uh, when I was at Lincoln College in New England with Nicole. And I, as the program director of criminal justice there, I saw the transitioning for law enforcement and the need to be involved with more human services and the need to engage the communities differently. I also am a recovery coach and a recovery support specialist and work for Better Choices program part-time uh, in West Hart and Waterbury, Connecticut for MCCA. Uh, I have lived experience 
in that region. I tell people all the time I'm an addict and they look at you funny when you say that, but I am, I'm a gambling addict. And I think in the human services field, you need to understand that people come from all walks of life um, and we have to take off our rose colored glasses and look at things from a perspective of the big picture and not just your own personal experiences. Um, and so I, I'm adamant about making sure people understand the realities and the needs for what I call humanity from the heart. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, you're not gonna be somebody who can succeed in the business of human services at any level. That includes law enforcement, that includes counseling everywhere. If you can't find your humanity in your heart, you need to find a new job. Yes, thank you so much. That was well stated. I want to return to some of that because uh, a little later when we in our conversation, because uh, some of our uh, some of some professions in human services are licensed, and um, I always struggle with um, the lack of, uh, for example, uh, training in ethics for mm -hmm. unlicensed human service workers, because I could have, a, you know, and I could work in the field of human services without any kind of degree that essentially qualifies me, you know, like a community action program or whatever. That's a human service. Um, I, I've been on a little bandwagon to try to get uh, my local community action program to start doing some training in ethics for the people that work at the front desk, you know, and uh, about maintaining uh, some confidentiality, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, it's that's something that uh, you, you just perked up something in my head. I'm going to go to, to uh, uh, Joe Oliver Yeager, who uh, is uh, up here in the top part of your screen. Joe, tell us, how you got to where you are and what you're doing. Absolutely. So I am the program director for human services administration at Granite State College. I'm also, I teach um, undergrad, graduate, and I'm also an adjunct at the Community College of Vermont. Ah. And yeah. Um, and so it's interesting. My past is, and I, and I really appreciate what you brought up, Bill, by the way, is so my background is as a therapist, and I was also a um, substance abuse counselor for a long time. And I created the addiction studies undergrad certificate at Granite State College as well. So to me, you know, human services, and I don't want to tangent into that, because I know we're going to be talking about that. But I think Bill brought up some really important points. I don't think there's any profession that doesn't touch upon human services, to be honest. And I mean, we could have business here and I, I could debate that. So I agree with you, Bill, and I appreciate you saying that. And in terms of ethics, um, yeah, it's embedded in everything we do. Um, I also teach the uh, CWEP um, foster caregiver courses at, well, it's part, where it's, it's not technically Granite State College. I think it's just granted in there. So I've been teaching those to foster families that are caregivers. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. as as people can uh, tell, some of our guests here can tell, uh, you have, our panel has a really broad background in, um, in human services. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a little curveball out there. All of us are academics. I'd like to hear what any of you have some thoughts about how do we get practitioners involved in the organization for human services? You know, somebody who is um, working not in an academic, most of our members, for example, are either academics or they're students. How do we get people who are practitioners involved? And I'd like to hear some ideas and I think one of the ways that one does that is to really show practitioners what is the value, what is that return on investment that they're going to receive, how does it enhance their, their professional lives as well as their personal lives. I also think it's, it's a matter of marketing and advertising to those organizations 
as to the importance of uh, the organization. Uh, case in point would be when we were, as conference chair, I proposed to them what we called the ambassadorship program, that ambass ambassadorship sponsorship, which yeah. I must say I got from Dennis. But it was really geared to nonprofits and human service agencies where they would pay a certain amount of fee to allow either 10 of their employees uh, to attend or if it was marketed to a college that 10 of the human service students would attend. So I think it is about a return on investment. It is about an ethos. It is about, you know, how does it enhance their practice and practicum? If, if Anybody else have an idea on that? Yeah, Joe. So, you know, it's interesting because I'm thinking about the fact that let's say, for example, there's a facility, you have caseworkers, people who are in human services. What if there's incentive from their organization saying, well, for everyone who joins a leadership or um, an organ a professional organization, you're maybe there's going to be, and again, nonprofit, there's maybe not a lot of money, but maybe there could be some type of incentive to have um, a professional organization, a part of your resume and and then getting you involved as well getting people involved how do we get them involved you raise uh, a, an interesting point uh when when i first became a member it was because at the time the dean of the school of human services at springfield college literally paid for every faculty member in the school even adjuncts he paid our dues to become members and um, I don't know that anything like that is, I know that things like that are very, very rare uh, these days, but you raise a good point. I'm wondering uh, if part of the incentive could be, I don't know, how uh, even figure out a way to, to network with one another. You know, so for example, uh, Nicole is... Uh, is teaching, is there some way to, I don't know, get practitioners to speak to her classes and, you know, sort of draw them in and, and as participants in that regard or whatever. Bill, you have any ideas about how we get practitioners involved? One of the things that I frequently end up having to do um, as an attorney is to get my CEUs. And depending upon uh, the problem is it becomes a state issue. Yeah, I mean, we, every state has certain standards that you have to meet to get CEUs, and I'm not certain that all the professions in the range, as you said, you know, the re receptionist at the local nonprofit may not ever need any CEUs. But I think that would be one potential way. Uh, whether through the national board, they they determine that at the national level for our conferences that there's certain. Uh, attempts be made within the states or within the regions to have states recognize the CEUs. And even if it's not a lot, it's just one more thing that might be yeah. the interest of getting uh, your staff involved. And then the other thing is maybe regionally or nationally, we can do something for those local nonprofits. And we can say that 80% of their staff has been trained in these three courses. And, mm -hmm. and create a certificate and put that on the wall at that local nonprofit to show that they're doing continuing education and that they're supporting their staff, um, not just from an academic perspective, but from a life perspective. I, 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 I'm liking what I'm hearing. Nicole, do you have any ideas on that? Um, my thought is maybe just to kind of frame it like we want their opinion. I don't know you know, going into a room, if you had a bunch of like PhDs and we're like, you know, like that kind of yeah. thing, but we want to hear from them. Like we're teaching it. We want to know what's going on in the field and the day-to-day -day work with the clients. Cause we need to bring that to our students, um, you know, and teach them how to be best prepared for their internships and everything else. So I think even just framing it, like we want to hear from you, we want your information, we want your input. Um, you know, that's very valuable to us. It's very valuable to the students and to the field in general. So even kind of spinning it that way or you know there's yeah, yeah. not a lot of information yeah well uh, speaking of of uh, our students etc i recognize that i better be on my game here because one of my students is in the audience so uh, <laughs> so 
they probably already think I'm a little off base, so that's okay. Um, another thing that comes up that I think has been a, a challenge for all of us in, in our line of work or the extended line of work, I, again, I'm going to practitioners, you know, as academics, all right, we 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 have all sorts of clubs we could belong to, you know, and uh, and that that that's uh, like a different story. But I'm I'm wondering um, if there is a way. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna sort of revert back to a COVID question here. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, well, let me. Let, all of us who might go food shopping, you you can't walk into a market without a sign saying we're hiring, right? Uh, COVID sent some people home. Um, a lot of uh, there, you know, I'm a, a baby boomer and I know that uh, my generation is sort of aging out of the workforce but that doesn't mean that the workforce isn't necessary to provide services for uh, my generation. Uh, but there are far fewer, so there are far fewer people that are in, that are sort of engaged in the workforce. COVID didn't help it. The 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 uh, uh, you know statistically, the generational differences didn't help it. Uh, how? What are some of the challenges that you folks think it uh, we face? As I'm going to call us globally a profession of people who work in human services. What What are some of the challenges to get uh, enough people uh, in in the in the field? You know, how do we help employers recruit or what have you? Um, if If I may, I, I think yeah. the Biggest issue, sadly, is the fact that it's not a high paying position. Human services is not, you're not going to be coming out super wealthy. Um, it's its something that I think we all have a passion for. Most people who go into it, there's a calling. Yeah. Um, you're, you're naturally a helper. It do, That doesn't mean that we can't um, recruit people to see that that's something that there is going to be a need. The older population is getting older and, and there's health problems and you know, we've got COVID didn't change poverty. COVID didn't change our food insecure people. COVID didn't change um, getting access to resources. So the jobs, you know, to in entice someone to do that work, I think part of it has to come from that internal motivation, that person. But how do we get them? You know, is it through marketing? Is it through, you know, the early years of college? It's really hard to say, but I think that that the needs definitely increased during COVID. Um, yeah. But I think being able to find people to do that work, especially if they had family members that had health issues, they don't wanna go out. People don't wanna leave. I had a student during 2021 who was doing her internship and her husband had health problems and she had to do a lot of it from home. And she said, I don't feel like I'm making a difference. I'm, I'm on Zoom, I'm doing paperwork. I wanna be, around people, but I'm afraid to be around people. So I think COVID really shut down a lot of those resources and the needs weren't being met, sadly. Those were a couple of things that came to my mind when we when we talked about having this was like, what are some challenges of getting people into the professions? And of course, the money incentive is not there. However, as Bill pointed out, sometimes we're doing things from the heart and Bill has his hand raised because he's ultra polite. Bill. So you're exactly right. Fear has been the driving um, concern for a lot of people. And, and I don't want to put gasoline on the fire, but I can tell you if we don't tell the people who are in the community that you need to, and, and I'll use law enforcement as a starting point, that you we're going to hire policemen. We're gonna, we have to hire policemen. So you're, you're, if you're not telling your best and your brightest students to apply for a job that in the town of Newington, after seven years, you're making $108,000 a year as a base salary, um, you need to be thinking about, are you meeting the needs of the community? Because those 
individuals can make money that have the degrees within the professions. Yes, in a nonprofit world, you do need a calling a little bit more because there isn't that kind of money. But in law enforcement, we need people, we need human bodies. And so if we're not hiring the best and the brightest, we're gonna hire the worst or the right. least among us, right. and they're gonna be causing more problems down the road. And, and so I think it's evidently clear that the community needs to step up its responsibility to point to people who are in the community that can make the difference. And also at the same time, it's up to the leaders of the community to recognize that, you know, there is more than just, you know, a, a person going to the police academy. You have to have a person who has um, an interest in doing the right thing. And that ethical component comes back to me because, yeah. and I've described it this way to other police officers. When we had critical incidents, I always used to say you need a checkup from the neck up. Okay, you need to go get a psychological check. I was completely wrong because humanity starts in your heart. Police die from heart and hypertension. Yeah. Firefighters die from heart and hypertension. I said, you need to check from the heart up yeah. and you start with your humanity. Did you talk about the impact of seeing that situation? Did you talk about the impact of having a family member get COVID and pass away? Yep. or a grandparent. And and that's right down to the level of being in that community service center. And, and then you can understand the fear and manage the fear that your employees are going to get, manage the fear that your students are going to get, and then start to build from there. Um, but if we don't address the fear factor, we're in trouble. And I'll give you an example. We had 12 people that died this past week in New Haven, Connecticut from opioid overdose fentanyl. And so the, the common denominator right now, we're telling everybody, go get a Narcan, <laughs> carry a Narcan kit, have Narcan in your purse or on your backpack, because you don't know when you're going to come across somebody who's, you know, in the community, just in the field. You're, you're walking across the green in New Haven, Connecticut, and somebody drops in front of you and you have Narcan, you might save their life. Bill, in, in Vermont for a while, they were giving them away for free at the, the pharmacies. I don't know how it is in Connecticut, but- Pretty uh, much the same way. Yeah, so it is an option. Um, you But you brought up something, if you don't mind me asking, because law enforcement, yes, it's part of human services, but it has other, sadly, other, um, and so does addiction, if we're speaking, stigma, because people are fearful of going into, you know, people, there's a negative uh, vibe against law enforcement, which there shouldn't be. We should be training. We should be making sure emotional intelligence, all those things. If we if we really train law enforcement um, on those things, their emotional intelligence, um, ethics, as you mentioned, I think that'll, that'll help switch because look at our country's a mess when it comes to law enforcement. Everyone's afraid. I go back to a gentleman named Sir Robert Peel who in the 1890s made nine principles, Peel's principles for law enforcement for metropolitan New London. And if you read through those, those are all things we've done. We've created community policing. We've created, you know, but we have failing to in, integrate the community. And we're failed to tell people that when you're in high school or junior high school, don't do certain bad things. Don't make bad choices. Now, sometimes those choices happen, you know, and, and then it's up to the administration of law enforcement to say, okay, this individual did this when he was 18 years old, he's now 26, he hasn't done anything else, and use a broader spectrum of thinking than just, well, he broke that rule, therefore he'll never be a policeman, because that's yeah. not Great. functionally uh, sufficient. Eight-year-old brain is very different than a 26-year-old brain. And we all, you know, so so we're talking about developmental differences in, in so what's going to, on. I'm good to tell my daughters not to marry any man before he's 29 years old. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, uh, one of the things that I forgot to mention, I think early on, uh, 
uh, before the, our guests arrived here, is that th this program has been uh, co-sponsored by the New Hampshire Association of Certified Public Managers. And I originally got involved with this because I was the program director for uh, the Bureau of Education and Training, uh, which operated the nationally accredited certified public manager program. And so it's the graduate group uh, uh, is one of the sponsors. And uh, w one of the things that's interesting about the group is uh, as public employees, a lot of them are in human services. So I thought this was also a good thing. One of the people who is the, the president of that organization is one of the guests in the room right now. And his job was uh, a supervisor of juvenile probation and parole officers. And he had a difficult task because they were wild Indians. Uh, you know, the, the, the people that are out on the street checking up on folks that have slipped up are... Um, it's hard work. It's hard work. And uh, supervising that group was a, a, a hard thing. So uh, my hat goes off. Frank Nugent is one of the people in the, that's in, in the audience today. And um, I, I just wanted to recognize the fact that that he was here and that I think that it's probably true that uh, it, this isn't, to me, this is interesting. As a... Uh, the, the people who work as what we call JPPOs in New Hampshire, juvenile uh, uh, parole officers, um, probation and parole officers, uh, they're, they're part of health and human services. They're not part of corrections. They're part of health and human services. So that's, that's uh, I, I think, uh, and, and it's uh, tough. You know, they have, uh, sadly, we have, a, a youth development center which incarcerates young people uh and that's a can be a nightmare too none of the none of these things run smoothly that's for certain it's hard work and uh it's not it's not meant for everybody to be in those professions uh i know that uh, in our uh, uh frank says hi dennis <laughs> anyway um one of the things that strikes me about um, some of our professions are that uh, the feet are planted in different parts of, in different aspects of society. So when we say human services, it's so broad. When we say law enforcement, it's broad. Um, I, you know, I don't know what the incentives are. I know, for example, in New Hampshire, the law enforcement officers that I know have um are in the the state retirement system they get to retire with fewer years than uh, uh a civilian uh, uh public employee would you know for full retirement they they have a 20 year retirement where they get uh half pay at 20 years whereas for a non law enforcement person it's 30 years <laughs> to get to that point and uh, in any event, I, I, I think that we, um, I'm, I'm not exactly certain how we go about this, but you, you've raised some great ideas about how, how we reach out to others. And it strikes me that this conversation about uh, working from our heart, uh, even though most of us may not make that much money working in human services. None of us would stop. None of us would stop. And we've, I'm listening to people and you all work in multiple places and what have you. Uh, uh, Janine, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to piggyback on, you know, what Joe has said, Bill, and even uh, Nicole has shared. And that is uh, for us to also understand that Human services has evolved or in some ways is stagnant or it's transforming, especially globally. And the key I also find, especially when Bill was speaking and, and Joe was speaking about ethics, is 
I find ethics to be extremely important, especially frontline, but top down and bottom up. In, in terms of really understanding uh, not only the maximizing and minimizing of values, but its intersectionality of the life world and the systems world, which sometimes you know can be lost in the teaching of human services. And I think also now, you know, the new lexicon, you know, is DEI, you know, and what is that, especially in terms of human services. And really, if we really think about DEI, it's, you know, diversity should be about delegating the differences and, and, and inclusivity is about celebrating those differences and equity should be about elevating those differences. But I find very interesting in today's job market, you see human services when you look at the what is required, social work is required, you know, or criminal justice is required. So when speaking to a graduate student or undergrad student as to why you should major in human services, they're kind of lost as to what, what is the career path? Where is it going to take me when many of these jobs, the description says social work, criminal justice, mental health counseling. So I think that is something that we have to think about, not only as educators and practitioners, but definitely the importance of, of ethics. I find ethics to be extremely important because of this global world, uh, the diversity of cultures that many a community is experiencing, and that maybe in, in our world or in America, we're starting to see the rumble, you know, the rumble of the silent that now has been given permission to speak out of fear, <laughs> as one of my colleagues said. You know, uh, I, two things. One is, um, to sort of piggyback on what you're saying, is I I worry about the state of our society because it has become mean-spirited. Yeah. You know, it's uh, everybody feels that they're a victim and that if somebody has some, somebody gets something, that means something's been taken away from them. And there are politicians and people out there who stir that up. I, we don't need to make mention any names who stir that up and make the most of that. And uh, I, I worry, I personally worry about the, the sort of the psyche of our society. Uh, I'm not certain that we, uh, you know, going back to uh, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, John Kennedy when uh, he said, we we don't seek a democratic solution or a Republican solution. We, we seek a good solution, you know, and those, those are, um, you know, we, we got to step back from our distrust, but how we build it back. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, encouraged. I, I'd like to say I was, but I'm not. The other thing is, Janine, your Boston accent came out. You said market. <laughs> and, <laughs> Janine, you be you. Janine grew up in greater Boston. And uh, do you live in uh, the Springfield area right now, Janine? I do, and uh, must say that I thoroughly miss Boston. Yeah. <laughs> um, in more ways than one, I, 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 it's a walkable city. Uh, great public transportation is becoming yeah. extremely diverse, but extremely also expensive. So yeah. we also see where that human service worker or that student, why would they go into the field? Right. What it's going to take someone with two children well over 90,000 you know yeah. to live in Boston I mean yeah it's, no it's it's a uh, it's crazy I, I live in a very very small town in uh uh central New Hampshire and we have a very interesting public transportation system it's called our feet <laughs> 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 Janine brought something up that I that it was, was very interesting. So I'm the head of the master's program in human services administration. And you would not believe how many applicants are write their application essay and they say, I want to be a social worker or I want to be a mental health counselor. I want to be a substance abuse counselor. And I have to then mes message them, contact them and say, this is not a clinical degree. 
Yeah, yeah. Human services is more than clinical work. And yeah. and I think that's the biggest breakdown is how do you how do you express that to students mm -hmm. who who immediately go human services, social work, human yeah. services. And so that's my biggest dilemma is marketing. How do we clarify? I go, I, I speak, I tell students, okay, what do you want to do? Foster care, there's such a need, at least in New England, for foster families. But you could be working in foster care, and that's considered human services. Case management, running a, a facility, that's human services. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many unique um, pieces. I have one student right now, a grad student, who's a parole officer, and she's getting her master's in human services. She said, well, my company's paying for it and they're willing to give me a pay bump. So she's learning and she had to take the grad level ethics, but she's learning about the administrative piece and she's a parole officer. So she's doing human, she's working with adolescents in New Hampshire, which I know Dennis had mentioned. Um, so, it, you know, I think it's that, that breakdown of, it is not that black and white. It is not just a clinical role. And I think that's where people, we do need to educate our students, our, our undergrad and high school students, look at different things. It isn't, you don't have to be doing that. You don't have to have a license. You know, I don't think you have to have a license to be a legitimate human services. Um, but I do think that cert certifications would be good. Maybe that's how we can get, you know, change. Nicole, to chime in on the council side of all of this, because he, you know, those of us, that, you know, especially, you know, we, we're looking for a council standards or meeting or we're judged by them. So here we presented this. And so it makes me wonder what what is the council's perspective uh, on this piece? So I know and it goes back and forth and I just hear like different conversations about like that human service board certified practitioner, that HSBCP that they had in place where people went and if you met certain requirements and then you took the test and then you would have that. And then that kind of like, I feel like kind of the conversation goes and then like a lot of people have it, but does it really mean anything? And then like, so there was a lot of issues um, with that. So there is that credential there. But again, if you want to apply for their job, what does that mean? Like they're looking for a social worker, they're looking for, you know, mental health counselor, you don't have that license. It's not a licensure. It's not recognized necessarily by any state. So I know they did make that attempt um, to have that credential, but mm. again, and then it was like different, you know, they want to do a different one. Like I just heard different conversations in different spaces, but yeah. it is out there, but yeah, what it means, like what it, I have it, but it like doesn't, <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean anything. Yeah. It means you, you have yeah. education. You have education and and it does legitimize what you do. Yeah. So well, you know, uh, uh, Joe uh, and I both w do work at Granite State College, and uh, obviously she is uh, higher up the food chain than this gypsy adjunct. But <laughs> one of the things that is offered there is a rel relatively new program, uh, a uh, certificate in nonprofit management, and. Uh, it is all of the courses that are in that can be taken as electives for people in the organizational leadership uh, degree program, uh, master's program. So they're master's level, although an undergrad can take the coursework also. Uh, it, it's uh, sort of duly uh, open to uh, both grad and undergrad students. And um I, I was very, very fortunate to uh, help design one of the classes. And uh, because, I, you know, we're all involved in a nonprofit <laughs> right here today. And so right. I, uh, I, I have, you know, I'm a community action board president. I've been involved in so many nonprofits. I started a nonprofit 30 something years ago that's still operating. And, uh, is well funded and what have you. I'm very, very proud of that. But uh, one of the things that uh, this was pitched as something that could prepare you to take uh, the test to become a certified nonprofit professional. Mm -hmm. And so it gets back to the question of what does that mean? It means to whoever's reading it, if it's important to them, it will mean something. And that's 
uh, you know, when I, uh, I think that most people, if I was a hiring manager and I saw that somebody took the time to take the coursework and then pass a test to get this designation, I would that would be worth something to me. I, I, I know that I, I would look at that favorably. Uh, you know, it's a, it's an interesting thing because this coursework that you have to take, but then you actually have to take a, a test to become the certified CNNP or whatever it, oh, I forget what the initials are, but certified nonprofit uh, professional, I guess that's what it's called. And uh, so that that's been an, uh, an interesting subset for uh, you know I, I think an interesting thing is that there are some people who have started to take that certificate program who then enroll as a graduate student that you know they their intent was to get that certificate and it became like a gateway kind of thing for them so that's I think that's kind of an interesting thing. But I, I've struggled with that myself. I have some certificates in, in certain things. And I say, well, you know, I I got the certificates because I was interested in the subject matter. And I never thought of it as something that might get me a job. But I list them on my resume because, uh, you know, you got to keep your resume up to date. You could be fired any time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so um, Bill, in the in the world of law enforcement, are there some specialty kind of certificates that people can get? Well, initially, yeah, everyone goes to the training Academy. academies um, throughout the country. Yeah, um, New Hampshire runs theirs with the state police. I've been to their academy uh, in Connecticut. We have a separate academy for our troopers from our municipals and some larger municipalities run theirs um, separate, but they have to meet the state standards and, and they're reviewed constantly. Um, we do have an accreditation level for individual police departments, but yeah. the bigger thing is private sector security has a number of certified professional um, areas and more so with my experience with getting the um, recovery coach certificate and the uh, resource recovery specialist certificate, I see those opportunities as a real good way to diversify your workforce, um, especially in the human services area. Many of the people I met at the uh, resource recovery specialist program were in my situation. They were in recovery um, long-term, short-term, they had issues that um, impacted their mental health over time. And, and I think that the, the elephant in the room today in the country is mental health and mental health services. And, mm -hmm. and that is the um, starting and ending point towards that humanity of the heart that I think is so important. And until we get the political um, groundswell to tell people that it is mental health, that we need to work on mental health, that that fear factor that was ignited and gasoline poured on it during COVID and, and, and where COVID came from and how COVID got here and, you know, and all the other biases that are fed into fear uh, or fed by fear um, becomes really problematic because, you know, any given day, and, and this goes back to some article I read when I was an undergraduate in 1979 at the University of Haven studying criminal justice in Psychological Today magazine, uh, the person who broke their shoelace, and that was the last straw for that individual. That was the last thing because then he couldn't go to work because he had a broken shoelace and his life just collapsed. And most people think, how could that be? But it's because we're all on a tightrope um, for mental health issues. I mean, if you know somebody that's walking on a, you know, a two by six on the six inch side, well, they're fine. But I think most of us are on like a one by one 
on a daily basis. And so, you know, your balance beam mentality is one fourth of a balance beam. And, you know, price of gas, price of food, I can't feed my child. What is it? I can't pay the electric bill in Connecticut because it doubled. I mean, yeah. what is it today yeah. that's going to be yeah. the, the, the push factor? And are we in every field, every yeah. human being, community, re outreach, church, whatever your support services are? Yeah. Are we prepared, ready, and able to help manage it? We're not going to fix it, but we can help manage it. Yeah. I, you know, I, uh, I, I, uh, two things. One is that uh, in our uh, last month, I think not last month, the month before, I think, uh, coffee and conversation, we had people who were involved with the community action program and and Belknap Merrimack counties, uh, and uh, um, I. I I'm the president of that group. One of our participants in the panel was uh, the Merrimack County Sheriff. And um, talk about doing things from the heart. About three nights a week, he drives around to homeless camps with food and water and blankets. And uh, he doesn't have to do it. It is from absolutely from the heart. And uh, I, I think that a lot of us, there are a lot of people in this country, I think Joe brought it up, and uh, there's there are a lot of people in this country who are distrustful of law enforcement. If they met people like you and John Croft, the person I just mentioned, they would get a totally different view of this. These people are working hard to just to keep people alive you know and it's not just about i don't know catching car thieves or whatever it's not it's not about that and it's not always about drugs and it's not always about that they are trying to take care of society in a way that um i don't know if there's anybody here who's been in the military but you know if you were out at the shooting range you'd have to police your brass which means clean things up, take care of things, right? So the, the term policing uh, is much broader than I think the average citizen looks at it. The other thing is I just got a message from one of our uh, attendees uh, by the name of Peter Burdett, who tells me that he uh, graduated from Springfield College in 1972 in PE. And a uh, little shout out to Springfield College, the uh, home of basketball and the basketball hall of fame um because dr ne so you can see a little statue in the in the in, on campus of dr nesbeth sitting on a bench with a basketball next to him so uh anyway uh a little shout out to to peter uh nicole tell us what what you have to say um I was just going to go back to something you mentioned previously about our students. We found obviously with all the, you know, supported them before, but within the last like two years or so, just the amount of almost like counseling and support that students need before class, during class. And it's not like, well, how do you do this assignment? It's like tears, like breakdown, yeah. like they need an awful lot of support um, from faculty. And what we do is we have um, bachelor and master students um, from local colleges who do their internship with us. Um, so they kind of have case kind of caseload. So they work with our field work students in like small groups and they check in with them weekly. So just the amount of like having, you know, faculty work with them and then having these interns, social work interns work with them, plus the normal wellness counseling um, things, but just putting them out at the agencies to help other people struggling with the same thing is just an awful lot um for some of them they can't the mental like burden they they can't even kind of get through the yeah. day themselves and then putting them in different agencies we've had a lot of usually they're in there for the same agency two semesters we've had a lot of people that have had a switch and kind of adjust because mentally they just couldn't they couldn't deal with their own stuff plus client stuff so we've yeah. seen a a yeah. big shift in that the last couple of years. You know, I, I'm curious because um, 
this generation, so my young, younger son is a freshman um, at UVM right now, and his generation is so much more vocal about their mental health issues. And he, they, they're, he'll text me, he'll be like, mom, I'm, I'm anxious. And, and I'll be like, what's going on? What, you know, explain it to me. Their generation can articulate their feelings so much better than say, even my daughter's generation, who's seven years older. Um, but I wonder if, if, sorry, I've got a big Malamute who hears someone at my door. Um, I wonder, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if the, um, if, if the, I don't know if it's a solution or not, if we start in kindergarten, emotional intelligence, um, resiliency training, something to help so that by the time they get to our stage, they've worked through, you know, they're, Bill, I don't know if you, I'm sure you know about Dr. Um, Gaber Mate. Dr. Gaber Mate states that childhood trauma, even something as simple as divorce, raises your chances of addiction more so than somebody who did not have a childhood trauma. He believes it's directly related, that, there, that there's less of a genetic connection. So if we got to our kids in kindergarten and started giving them, well, what do you do when things are stressful? How do you handle stress? You know, I, I just, it, it just troubles me. And, I, and like I said, I'm thankful that my son's generation feels confident saying, I'm anxious today. How do, I, should, I don't wanna skip class, but I'm having anxiety. And so he's te texting me. I'm like, try to, you know, we go through whatever, but I'd love him to go to maybe the school counselor. Tell the school counselor what you're feeling. UVM has a wonderful uh, program. Most of our schools do. So just my two cents on. You know, as you, as you mentioned this, I think of people, uh, I, I was born in the 1940s and uh, <laughs> so I'm old and people of my generation, uh, you know, I'm like the first wave of baby boomers. So I was born in 46 and, um, but not 1846. Anyway, Ages people of my generation were, that would be the last thing you would do yeah. would be to yeah. admit that you had 100%. some emotional struggle. I mean, you were almost taught and to make matters worse, I went to Catholic school. So you never raised things like that. You just got in line and, saluted and held your rosary beads and whatever and hope not to get spanked uh but it was it it is you make a very uh solid point our younger people today are not afraid to talk about uh their feelings i actually believe that aside from the work that people do around them to make it more comfortable it is part of our popular culture also. Yeah. Uh, you know, there uh, you can turn on TV and there are people talking about folks that have problems and, and how they're feeling and, and what have you. So uh, I think it's it, it has been more acceptable. And uh, thank heaven. I think that's a, a great thing. Yeah. We're... Uh, we're I, I wanted to see if any of the folks in our audience have uh, a question that they'd like to pose. So, uh, because we, we have a few more minutes and I'd like to see if any of them have a, a pressing thing. I wanted to mention that Frank Nugent that I I, I, I mentioned before also had been an adjunct at uh, uh, Springfield College when they had a Manchester, New Hampshire campus. And, uh, and so uh, he, he's, he, uh, was a practitioner out in the field, but he also uh, 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 taught as an adjunct at that um, uh, Manchester campus when Springfield had nine all around the country. So they had the regional campuses. Can I pose a question to the students in the audience? Because sure. I frequently have found, and I did some early uh, work with my classes this fall, everyone's talking about the use of uh, a technique called de-escalation. Mm. Uh, and, and I question whether or not the average citizen understands what de-escalation is. Mm. And so my non-professional, nowhere near scientific research project with my students did this. I gave them this example. 
you wake up in the morning, you're in your apartment, your dorm, your significant other roommates are in the area. You stub your toe and you have a couple explicit, oh my God, damn moments. And that person in your life that you know walks in and says, what's wrong? Can I help? And the obvious to most of us is like, no, you can't. And we escalate just because somebody asked us because we have to admit we were clumsy enough to stump our toe and we don't want to, you get angry and you escalate the response because you can't help me, it's my pain. And we forget that we're now expecting people who don't know you, who aren't with you as a roommate or significant person in your life. And then they're gonna walk in and they're gonna try to figure out in a split second, how your emotional state is in that moment to then defuse it, if they can defuse it. Because most of the time you have to convince the person that you're trying to de-escalate that they're the one that controls this emotion and you have to ask them to slow down. You have to ask them to take a moment, take a breath, can we talk? Because if you don't, you're just going to get that embarrassed, angry frustration. And, and I just want to know if anybody's thought about the actual definition of de-escalation. And mm -hmm. given that scenario, how do you respond? What you're describing is emotional intelligence, having that ability to stop and go. Um, so when I stub my toe and, and I curse and whatever, if my husband goes, hey, are you okay? I, do I have that ability to stop in that moment when I'm in pain going, no, no, honey, don't worry. I'm okay. Versus <laughs> I'm fine. You know, <laughs> we are in control of our emotions. I think that's emotional intelligence as well. And when you first started mentioning it, Bill, the first thing that popped into my head was um, distracting a baby or a child or a toddler who wants to do something and you go, oh, look, a deer. It's sort of that like de that de-escalation in my brain is how do we bring it back down? How do we bring it? To, we're manageable. But I think it, it really is emotional intelligence. That self-awareness. Can you be self-aware when you've been hurt or when something immediate like that, you know, you can't control how you're going to react to pain necessarily. So, but then, but you can control how you respond to the, the kind person who offers to, you know, help you out. So I think, I, I, I think we all potentially use that, I hope, with emotional intelligence. I, uh, it involves the degree of self-regulation too. You know, I mean, you have to be able to know yourself, like like uh, Bill said, from the heart up. Yeah. You, know, you need to know when, you know, what to buy in and what not to buy in. What battle to, to you know, what you give life to. You know, when it comes to conflict, what do you give life to? Yeah. So there's a, a self-regulation that also is a part of emotional intelligence. You know? We're we're at our, our, the end of our program, and I'm going to uh, uh, bribe both Laurel and Bailey to let uh, Dan Bromberg know that I didn't mess it up too badly. You were wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I I think that the the folks uh, between Nicole and Bill and Janine and Joe, uh, they provided us with lots of things to think about, and they demonstrated that they did have the kind of heart that Bill mentioned. So uh, I thank everybody uh, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.